Okay, good morning. Uh, hello all. Uh, welcome to the first edition of uh, Quaps Didactics. Today we are pleased to have Dr. Caroline Mueller. Uh, Caroline is an assistant professor at Institute of Science and Technology Austria and a CNRS researcher in France. Uh, she finished her PhD at New York University in 2008 and worked as a postdoc researcher at MIT and Princeton before moving back to France. She has authored many interesting papers in ocean, atmospheric, and climate sciences. One of the recent ones Caroline co-authored is an article in the annual Reviews of Fluid Mechanics on Spontaneous Aggregation of Convective Storms, which is the subject of today's talk. So Caroline, welcome. Thank you very much. Thank you. It's really nice to see you virtually, but <laughs> you know, I get some news from former colleagues and uh, and thank you for the invitation. So yes, today we'll talk about uh, basically this review paper. I'll try to give a um, sort of a broad introduction to the main results. I won't dive into too much mathematical details because I assume that the interested reader will go into the paper, but rather I'd like to give you some intuition about the uh, physical processes behind this self-aggregation. So first I have to define it. And I actually want to spend some time talking more generally about cloud organization. And um, by the way, feel free to interrupt me if you have any question um, at any point. Uh, I'm fine with this. So self-aggregation of convective storms is actually one sort, one type of cloud spatial organization. So we all know cloud organization, the biggest or the most spectacular example is the hurricane or tropical cyclone as this one approaching uh, Florida. There are other types, and I want to discuss this a little bit in the first uh, introduction. And then I'll specifically talk about this self-aggregation and what are the physical processes involved. And then if time permits, I have a, an optional third section on uh, implications for precipitation extremes that I will try to um, go through quickly. Okay, but first, uh, as I said, we all know that clouds are organized and I often show this picture. So this is the blue marble that was taken by astronauts on um, one of the Apollo missions, I believe. And it's obvious from this picture that clouds are spatially organized. They take different forms in the tropics uh, or in the extratropics, but they are not isolated uh, little cotton features. And um, maybe some of you take those pictures for granted, but something that I realized actually not that long ago is that we haven't had those beautiful pictures for that long. In fact, uh, the first picture of uh, cloud large scale structures or of earth actually from upper at the upper atmosphere as far as I know dates from the second world war or after the second world war in 19, 1946 where we see the earth from a rocket and uh, you start to see that indeed clouds as we can see them from the ground some somewhat isolated cotton uh, features are not isolated this they form large scale structures that are visible once you view them from space. And in fact, the first satellite image is from the 60s. And the resolution, as you can see, is rather pathetic for today's standards. And we had to wait until the 70s to have global uh, satellite coverage and or the 80s even, and to have those beautiful pictures from space. And in fact, this I realized, so, so we're sitting on an amazing amount of data. And I just want to emphasize that it is a wonderful time for cloud science and atmospheric science in general, because we have so much data to back or disprove our hypothesis. Uh, so I think it's an exciting time for atmospheric science and cloud science in particular. And actually this was brought to my attention by a colleague of mine who told me, well, you know, Caroline, if you had been born at the time of Tintin on the Moon, and I don't know if you know this comic, but it's very good. Um, you would be out of business because there is no cloud. And in fact, if you look at the cover, um, the view from the moon is a, a planet without any cloud. And now from the pictures taken from satellites or from the um, Apollo missions, we know that's obviously not the case. So I actually went through the whole comic uh, just to make sure. And if you actually look in detail, you do see some images where there are clouds, but they are scattered and they're randomly distributed. They are not, they don't form those beautiful large scale organizations that we now know. So this is a sort of a dynamic view of this uh, beyond the picture. What we are looking at is, a, it's called a year of weather. It's published every year online 
And if you uh, turn on the sound, you will have some comments from a, a weather scientist. And um, what is shown in white is a signature of high clouds. So it's from uh, thermal radiation. So it's not the visible, it's not actual clouds, although it looks like clouds because it's white. It's actually the clouds that are cold. This is um, from a satellite product that is sensitive to temperature. So basically, if the temperature that the uh, satellite instrument receives is cold, it means that the object emitting was high in the atmosphere, it was cold, so it's a high cloud. Right, so the white regions are places where you have clouds that are high in the atmosphere and thus cold compared to the surface. But what I want to point out here, again, you can look at this online. There's a year of weather published uh, online every year. The 2017 is interesting because there's a lot of hurricanes. So for people in Florida, it's probably a, a crucial year. Um, but so here, what I wanted to show is that this spatial structure, as you can see, is not uh, completely random. They're sort of emerging structures, especially if you look near the equator. We see sort of what we call popcorn convection. And so uh, clouds that have, I would say, smaller scales are, or, or more randomly distributed than in the mid latitudes where they form those comma like structures that are embedded in the high low pressure systems. And here, I mainly want to focus on tropical clouds. And this is a beautiful image of our atmosphere. And again, I think the um, data that is available now is, is wonderful. And you could spend your whole weekend looking at this video. But in my opinion, an equally beautiful image of the atmosphere or of clouds is this one. And so here, what I'm showing you is a Havmuller diagram. So uh, evolution versus time uh, and longitude of outgoing long wave radiation. So again, this temperature uh, emission, which is cold when there's a cloud and warm when there's no cloud, because then you see the surface. Uh, the anomaly of this outgoing long wave radiation tells you uh, the um, anomalous cloud cover versus anomalous low cloud cover. So high cloud versus low cloud cover. So this is a, a representing or representative or a proxy for cloud cover. And so if we look at how the cloud cover or the cloud uh, variability evolves as a function of time, we see that there are uh, different patterns, but you can identify uh, some wavy propagations. And these are called uh, equatorial waves. And there's a, a whole family of them. You have Kelvin waves, you have equatorial Rossby waves. You have also, also a very large sort of wavy pattern here. I hope you can see my mouse. Yes, okay. So here you have a, a very large scale wavy pattern, which is the madden julian oscillation or MJO. And here you see that beyond those very large scale that I showed on the previous animation, you also have those um, sort of planetary scale or synoptic scale wavy patterns that dictate the cloud cover. Um, but here, if you look even closer, you see that once in a while, you see those sort of orange potatoes or formations that are ubiquitous, a little bit everywhere within the wave packets. And these are actually not that small. They're small compared to the synoptic scale of the waves, but they're still mesoscale, so hundreds of kilometers, which means larger than individual clouds. And those mesoscale convective systems, unlike their uh, parent equatorial waves, are poorly understood. The physical processes leading to this mesoscale organization is poorly understood. And as I said, they look small here, but actually they're not small, they are larger. This is a famous picture, I think, of Brazil of one of those mesoscale convective systems where you see that the cloud uh, system is larger than the individual clouds that fuel it. And uh, you have several here north of Australia, and here there's one over Austria, actually, where you see the uh, formation of the system. You have, uh, again, the, so the color is a proxy for temperature. So the redder, the colder, so the higher the cloud. So this is a proxy for cloud cover. Um, and here you see that the clouds that are somewhat individually spaced and, and randomly distributed merge into one large system, which is uh, larger than the individual clouds that formed it. So this is what I'm interested in, uh, convective organization in, in general, and more specifically at the mesoscale, so hundreds of kilometers. 
So this was sort of a, an introduction or an overview of uh, convictive or clouds. Yeah, so I use conviction. Conviction refers to the movement of air within which the clouds are embedded. So when I talk about conviction, I mean the upward movement of air typically that lead to cloud formation. And uh, so here I've introduced cloud organization or convection organization. Um, and here I want to specifically introduce this self-aggregation. So as I said, convective organization is, is uh, spectacular, it's beautiful, but it's difficult to understand. And so one route that has been taken by many people, including uh, Alison, is to look at organization in idealized settings. The idea being that if it's idealized, then maybe we can understand more cleanly what processes are leading to the organization. And one phenomenon that has triggered quite a lot of excitement in the recent decades, this is, a, by the way, at the bottom, not an exhaustive list of all the publications on this. Um, so one uh, particular mode of organization in idealized settings is self-aggregation. And this is what I'm illustrating here. I'm showing uh, in the top panel a simulation of a cloud reserving model called SAM, where uh, the everything is homogeneous. So again, it's highly idealized. The, the earth is flat, it's doubly periodic. The sea surface temperature is constant. Everything is constant. There's no land, ocean, nothing. And you see that in the top panel, the clouds, which are the gray surfaces, are triggered. And as I said, clouds are associated with upward motion. Uh, they're um, coupled with the circulation, and they tend to form when the air goes up. And you see that the clouds are generated pretty much everywhere, randomly over the domain. So that's what we call popcorn convection. Now in the bottom panel, the only thing that I've changed is the size of the domain. And yet the convection and the clouds look very different. All the convection, all the upward motion and the clouds associated are in one fraction of the domain, whereas the rest of the domain is very dry and devoid of clouds. So um, this has been called uh, self-aggregation. Sometimes it's referred to as instability of the popcorn state or disorganized radiative convective equilibrium in our jargon. And uh, as I said, it has triggered quite a lot of excitement. And so what I want to do now is give you an overview of what leads to this self-aggregation. And to do that, I will use this schematic, uh, which is sort of central in the explanation. Um, but before I, so there's four main processes, physical processes that have been proposed as leading to this self-aggregation of conviction. And before I, I, I uh, tell you about them in detail, let me just tell you all of them work in the same way. Either the feedback or the process, the physical process will favor clouds where there are clouds. So if you have a cloud, uh, the cloud interacts with its neighborhood or its uh, local environment to create conditions that are favorable to another cloud. So a cloud will favor a cloud, which will favor a cloud in the same location, and that will tend to cluster the clouds together in space. So that's one feedback that gives you aggregation. Or um, those processes can also um, oppose cloud formation in regions where there is no cloud. So if you have a region without cloud, the conditions are even less favorable to, to clouds. And that also tends to separate the domain into a moist, convecting, cloudy uh, region and a dry region devoid of clouds. So I hope that's clear. Um, if that's okay, then I'll dive into the first uh, physical process, which is the radiative cooling in the dry region. And the radiative cooling in the dry region is a pr physical process that um, opposes cloud formation in regions devoid of clouds. And the way it works is, uh, I'll just use the schematic here, because the, the region is dry, the atmosphere will emit, will cool radiatively very efficiently to space. There's not a lot of water vapor to absorb the outgoing long wave radiation, so there's strong cooling. And the cooling of the air makes the air heavier, so it sinks, and it generates a boundary circulation, shown in the red arrow. And why does that prevent cloud formation? Well, if you have a subsiding or descending circulation in the dry region because of mass conservation, then you must have divergence from this dry region, and that tends to make uh, create a flow near the surface from the dry region to the moist region. And that will tend to dry further the dry region. Okay, so let me show you in more detail how that works. If that was not clear, uh, I, that was just a, 
um, brief overview. Now I'll quantify it a little more thinly. So the first thing is uh, in those simulations that I showed, we um, went and removed the different feedbacks that could be responsible for aggregation. And what are those? Well, again, these are feedbacks of uh, related to the fact that clouds interact with their environment. And it could be surface flux feedback. So the fact that if you have a cloud, then it will change the surface fluxes, the evaporation from the ocean below it. Or it could be the radiation, this radiative cooling I just mentioned. And so when we remove the different feedbacks, we see that the only feedback that is um, needed for aggregation or crucial is the long wave radiative feedback. So it's this atmospheric uh, radiation and radiative cooling that is crucial for um, for the aggregation. If you remove it, you lose the convective aggregation. I didn't say, sorry, this is a top view of atmospheric humidity. So the simulations that aggregate are the simulations where you see a dry region and a moist region separating. That's what we call aggregation. So you see here, you have a dry region. This is low atmospheric humidity. And you have a moist region. Uh, here you have a dry region, a moist region. And in the third uh, panel, there is no aggregation. OK, so the radiative uh, cooling is important, or the interactive radiative cooling is important. And again, that's related to the circulation that it entails. Now, how does that work? Well, to understand this, what we did is look at a simulation that aggregates, like the one shown at the bottom. And then we ordered, uh, so we know that the radiative cooling is important. The fact that radiative cooling is different in dry and in moist regions. So let's look at it. What does the radiative cooling look like in dry and in moist regions? And this is exactly what's shown on the left. This is radiative cooling as a function of height and moisture. So we put all the dry columns on the left, all the moist columns on the right, and we compute the radiative cooling for those different moisture bins. Now, if you do this, you see that in dry columns, you have very strong radiative cooling, as I showed in the schematic at the beginning. And this very strong radiative cooling, as I said, generates a circulation, which is shown on the right. So the right shows the same thing, height and moisture, but now the color shows energy, the energy that's relevant for moist convection, so the moist adding energy. And in black, I'm showing the stream function, so the circulation. So as expected, in the moist region, there is upward motion, cloud formation, then the air um, travels to the dry regions and then subsides and returns to the moist column. What is specific of self-aggregation is this low-level loop that I highlighted with some arrows. And this is due to the radiative cooling. This is generated by the radiative cooling. Now, why does that matter? Well, if you look at this circulation, you see that it's the, the surface flow here is taking the energy in the yellow colors, the energy from the dry column, and it's transporting it to the moist column. So this circulation is taking energy. It's taking money from the poor. It's taking energy from the dry and giving it to the moist. That's a positive feedback. And, and here I'm just illustrating in 3D what this circulation looks like. This is going from dry to moist. So it's diverging near the surface from the dry and converging energy and moisture into the moist region. So that's one process. I hope that was clear. One process through which aggregation and, and clustering of moisture and clouds can occur is through this circulation due to radiative cooling in dry regions that brings energy and moisture from the dry column to the moist column reinforcing the moisture gradient. Okay, so maybe I'll skip this and I'll go to the next, um, um, the next uh, feedback of physical process. This uh, process is turbulent entrainment at the edge of clouds. So for anyone who has ever seen a cloud form, which I'm assuming most of you have, um, you see that it's quite turbulent. It usually it looks like a cauliflower structure and it's very turbulent at the edge. So what happens at the edge where the clouds, as they go up, um, they will entrain air from the neighborhood. And if um, there was a cloud before, the air will be moist and that will tend to favor the cloud formation. Conversely, if there was no cloud before, the air will be dry and the turbulent entrainment will entrain dry air, which will make the cloud less buoyant. So in other words, if you had a cloud before, it's moisture, and so it's easier to make a cloud. That's a positive feedback. All right, let me go again. This was sort of an overview. I hope that's 
that helps. If it doesn't, I'll just quantify it more carefully. So this is just a reminder, by the way, this is a really great resource. This is from the Comet program. Um, they have a, a website with a lot of online courses in meteorology and um, and they have uh, really nice, it's free, you just have to sign up with your uh, an email address and they have a lot of uh, different animations and courses that are, I think, very well made. Anyway, so this is the typical life cycle of a deep cloud. Basically, at the beginning of the cloud life, you have some sort of something triggers the upward motion. So here it's convergence, for instance. Then you have upward motion. As the air goes up, it cools because temperature decreases with height. And as it cools, the water vapor condenses into liquid or ice at the coldest temperature. Then eventually the air is no more buoyant and it reaches what we call the equilibrium level. And then it spreads horizontally. Now within the cloud, you also have uh, microphysical processes that make the droplets larger and larger and they start to fall as, as rain. Some of it makes it to the surface, some of it evaporates. And this downward motion of the drops and the evaporation of rain also cools the air. It's latent cooling uh, as the evaporation of rain cools the air and that generates downward motion, which sort of uh, kills or stops the upward motion that started the cloud. I call it start, the, the cloud suicide. The cloud needs upward motion, but then it generates downward motion that stops the cloud. And that's the total life cycle is about three hours for a deep convective cloud. Okay, but so that's the life cycle. Now, if you look at the edge of cloud, this is the turbulence that I was uh, talking about. If you entrain air, which is dry, what happened, if you enter an air that is dry, then some of your droplets will evaporate because if it's dry, um, you can imagine that the, the liquid, you will not be saturated anymore and the liquid will evaporate, that will cool the air and that will reduce the cloud buoyancy. So entrainment of dry air reduces cloud buoyancy and opposes cloud formation. Conversely, if you have moist conditions that will favor cloud formation. So it's always this idea that clouds favor clouds. That's uh, that's a positive feedback on the aggregation. It tends to cluster the, the domain into a moist region and a dry region. So this was called the, the moisture memory feedback. Um, and consistently in simulations, if you increase the entrainment in the numerical simulations, uh, then the uh, increased mixing favors aggregation, consistent with this feedback. And there's a very nice theoretical paper that captured this behavior in a simple model. So I will try to walk you through this. So basically, uh, this simple model just look, looks at the evolution of moisture. This is on the right, just a top view at, of atmospheric humidity, like I showed before. So you're in space, you're looking down. This is longitude latitude, and this is uh, the moisture field. Moist regions in blue and dry regions in red. Now, at each point of this grid, what they do is they write an evolution equation for humidity. And so basically you have a, a moistening term through convection. If you have some convection, which can be um, dictated by uh, uh, physics. But anyway, so you have a moistening term, you have a drying term due to subsidence, due to radiation. And you have some horizontal transport that they model as, as diffusive. Uh, I purposely did not write down the equations because again, I think the interested uh, listener will go to the paper. There's a paper by Craig and Matt that originally introduced this model. And it was recently refined uh, in a paper by Biagioli and, and Tompkins, which might be impressed now. So basically you can write the evolution equation of atmospheric humidity. And it turns out that the right hand side you can write as minus the gradient of a potential of a function of, of humidity. Now, why is that interesting? It's interesting because whenever you have an equation like this, you know that the state, so the moisture, will be attracted to the minima of the, the potential. And let me show you why. Let's imagine that the potential looks like this. And now imagine you're in conditions where it's moister than the minimum. If, if, the, um, if, if, if it's moister than the minimum, then the right-hand side will be negative because DVDI is positive, so the right-hand side is negative, and so the humidity will decay, will decrease towards the minimum. Conversely, if you're on the left-hand side of the minimum, then the right-hand side is positive, and you tend to, in, in either case, you tend towards the minimum of the potential. 
And uh, the Kragen might have modeled this and with a certain range of the physical parameters, so you can play with the initial conditions, the temperature, etc. you can get states where you do have aggregation. So you see a multiple equilibria um, uh, triggered and you have uh, the moist equilibrium and the dry equilibrium coexisting. And that's a very nice theoretical approach to this. Okay, and finally, two last uh, um, feedbacks. The third physical process that can help clustering aggregation is those cold pools below clouds. So if you remember um, in these animations that I showed, you had cloud formation associated with upward motion. And in the cloud, I mentioned those microphysical processes, the rain falling, it evaporates, and that cools the air through latent cooling. Now what happens is the air is cold, it goes down below the cloud, and when it reaches the surface, it has to spread horizontally. It has, it's heavier because it's cold, so it spreads at the surface. And this is what I'm showing here. So this is, again, an animation of those simulations that I showed before. Clouds over, and now in color, it's near surface humidity, water vapor. And I wanted to show that you see below clouds that are precipitating, you have cold pools spreading. And when those two cold pools meet, you typically have a cloud forming. I don't know if you could spot this. Let's try to follow a cold pool edge. So here we have a cold pool edge that's going to meet another one. And when they intersect, boom, you have a cloud forming. So the clouds will lead to cold pools that spread, and they will favor cloud formation in their vicinity. All right, and I'll just go back to the schematic. This is sort of what we try to illustrate here. You see the cold pool spreading, and at their edge, they will favor the, um, the triggering or the formation of new clouds. So again, that's clouds that are favoring clouds in their environment, in their neighborhood, if you want. And so that will tend to cluster clouds in one region in the domain. Okay, always this idea, clouds favor clouds in their lo uh, local environment. Okay, through cold pool collision. So uh, these cold pools are one of those physical processes leading to aggregation. And this has been nicely captured also in a conceptual model. Um, and I would say, I mean, this was sort of the idea of the review that a lot of work has been done uh, in terms of numerics, in terms of observations. And um, now we've understood enough the physical processes that uh, the community has managed to successfully represent them in very simple conceptual or even mathematical models. And so the idea of this review, and Alison has many reviews on aggregation on, on more the numerical aspects, and this uh, is really inspired by this numer numerical work uh, that has led to the development of those conceptual um, simple models. So the review is sort of uh, inspired by this and trying to give an overview of the theoretical fundamental understanding that we have and how it's been captured in, in mathematical or conceptual models. And so this one, uh, it's the case as well. The conceptual model is the following. Uh, here on the left, you see a, a large a simulation like the one on the top. And on the right, it's just a, a, a model where if at every point you have a probability of triggering a cloud and then there's a cold pool spreading. And whenever you have collision of cold pools, you create a new cloud. And when you play with such a dynamical system, you can get the clustering or the aggregation of clouds as well. Um, all right, uh, just one comment. Uh, cold pools help organizing, as I said, but they can also oppose uh, organization. And this is something that's still quite mysterious and that we're currently working on um, here. But so here I'm showing again the simulation where you see clouds over water vapor. It's the same as the previous slide. And now on the right, I put a simulation where I um, do not allow for cold pools. So I remove the cold pools. How do I do that? Well, if you remember, the cold pools are generated when the rain evaporates, as shown on this animation you've seen before. The rain evaporates, the upward motion becomes downward, and then it spreads. So an easy way to remove cold pools is just by not allowing the rain to evaporate. It's just that simple. So in this simulation, that's exactly what I did. I removed the rain evaporation, and then there's no downdraft. And then as you can see, it still aggregates. So I just said that cold pools help aggregation, but if I remove them, it also helps aggregation. And so it's something that, uh, I mean, that Alison can tell you as well, whenever you think you know something about aggregation, just be ready to find out the opposite. 
So I would say this is still a little bit mysterious and this is something that we're working on. But I thought that was interesting to point out that corpus have this ambivalent role. Okay, I'll skip this. And finally, the waves. So uh, the this process is one where clouds favor clouds. And the way it works is when you have a cloud, it will trigger waves as we illustrated here as interfacial waves between the free troposphere and the boundary layer. And those whale, waves sorry, will favor cloud formation in the vicinity of clouds, thus leading to aggregation and clustering of clouds. And how it works in detail is uh, originally uh, from a paper, a seminal paper, I would say, by Brian Mapes, um, where he looked at the different waves that are triggered by a deep convective or a mesoscale convective system um, that occurs, say, here at zero. And so what happens is that within the convective system, you have warming due to uh, latent heating, but you also have, so you have uh, basically the first barotropic wave, which is due to this latent heating throughout the troposphere. But you also have excitation of the first baroclinic, which is a warm and a cool uh, signal. Okay, again, because you have heating here and cooling here, especially at the end of the cloud life cycle. And so the it turns out that the barotropic wave travels faster than the baroclinic one. Is there a question? Or... Okay. So the, the barotropic wave travels faster. And the barotropic wave, because it warms, it tends to stabilize the atmosphere. It's harder for clouds to form in that case. Whereas the baroclinic one is slower and it tends to destabilize by cooling. If you cool the air, then imagine if you have your cloud, next cloud parcel going up, it's meeting a cold environment, it's gonna be buoyant, it's gonna keep going. So that's gonna favor atmospheric instability and cloud formation, right? So again, the the, propagation of waves tends to make the neighborhood of the cloud more unstable and the far field more stable. So clouds favor clouds and uh, that's a positive feedback, which was again, uh, actually very nicely captured in a very simple shallow water model. All right, and I think I will stop here. Um, this is sort of optional. I'll just mention one thing is that we don't look at aggregation just because convective organization is spectacular. We have lots of reasons to do this. It changes the outgoing long wave radiation to space. So it interacts with the energetics, but it also matters for extremes. Uh, uh, when you see a, a hurricane coming, you know the rain will be strong, but it's the same for a mesoscale convective system. And consistently in simulations of aggregation, we have increased precipitation extremes of about 30%. And if you're interested, I will direct you to our paper uh, from two years ago, I guess now, where we investigate in detail where, why extremes are heavier when it aggregates. And with this, I will thank you and I will happily answer any question. Thanks, Caroline. Uh, there are a couple of questions for you in the, in the chat. Okay, should I open it then? Uh, yeah, the, the first one is from ah. Hayden Wilder. Yeah, uh, he's asking, uh, why does domain size impact organization in models? Yeah, that's a good question. So this was actually the motivation for, oh yeah, I forgot my commercial break. Uh, as uh, Keshav mentioned at the very beginning, I moved to Vienna quite recently, actually to ISTA, Institute of Science and Technology, Austria, and they're hiring in earth sciences. So please contact me if you have any interest in Earth sciences and classical music, because Vienna is home of classical music. Okay, end of commercial break. So why is it sensitive to domain size? Um, I don't think we have a definite answer, but what we found, and this was again the motivation for the paper, uh, our GRL paper in 2015 with Sandrine Bonny. So basically I told you this, um, circulation here is very important and it's generated by basically the strong radiative cooling in dry regions. Now it turns out that if you, if the domain is larger, uh, you can show that the radiative cooling in the dry regions is stronger. And so you more likely trigger this circulation. And that's partly because the cloud, the low cloud amount is sensitive to the domain size. And uh, why that is, uh, it's, I don't know. But anyway, it's all consistent. We find a stronger radiative uh, feedback on larger domains, which then means more easily aggregation. 
hope that answers the question. Uh, does the prescribed SST in the simulation with no rain affect the result? No rain precipitation. You mean no evaporation of rain, I guess. In a realistic air C interaction, would it a convection lead to color SST and kill the convection? So that's a really good question. Oh, you're very welcome. Uh, that's a good question. So we also looked at this. I mean, several people have. Um, so what happens is if you put an interactive SST, uh, when the dry patch, so as you could see, maybe it's clear here. Let's look whatever at this one. So you see that aggregation actually starts with a dry region that becomes drier and drier and strengthens. Right, so that's typically the path to aggregation. Uh, you have a dry blob that is created. It becomes drier and drier. And eventually, all the moisture gets confined to the rest of the domain. Now, imagine you put an interactive SST below this. What happens is that the dry patch, at first, it's drier. So it receives more short wave from the sun. So what will happen is that the dry region will warm. And that we tend to oppose the um, the high pressure or the divergence from the dry region. So at first, an interactive SST, you still have aggregation, just it takes longer. But then eventually, the dry region becomes so dry that this short wave effect, this uh, radiation from the sun, becomes secondary compared to the long wave cooling. And the increased long wave cooling actually cools the atmosphere more, and so you have a higher pressure, and that. Uh, accelerates the aggregation again. So it sort of uh, it depends on what time scale. At first, it slows down the aggregation, and then eventually it accelerates it. And I think, yeah, these are actually okay. Never mind. Uh, this uh, I should say this uh, interactive SST was the PhD thesis of a uh, thesis of uh, Sarah Shamek. So if you're interested, those papers discuss that. And um, yeah, Adrian Tompkins also has done some work with interactive SST. If you're interested. You can send me an email or ask Alison, she knows all about this. But I'm happy to send you the references. Mm, Professor Vasu has a question. Yes, uh, good evening. Uh, I'm Vasu Misra, a faculty at COAPS and uh, department. A very interesting talk. Uh, your argument about uh, radiative cooling in the dry regions, uh, I, I had a question on that. Wouldn't it lead to uh, destabilization of the column? Because after all, the lapse rate is also equally important. It's just not the subsidence and the transport of the uh, moist static energy. But the uh, radiative destabilization is also a factor. Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, no, that's a good point. So, I mean, it's sort of a the leading order of the radiative cooling is that it dries so much that even if it were unstable, no convection would survive. It entrains dry air. There's, I mean, in those simulations in particular, it becomes very extreme, very, very dry. And it's impossible for convection to make it for even for a small amount of entrainment. Um, so I'm sorry, uh, along the same lines of argument, uh, on the MJO time scale, um, the emerging consensus of the recharge discharge mechanism of the moist static energy, where advection of the MSC is considered to be far more important in the moisture modes, and radiative heating, our radiative uh, column integrated radiative heating and surface evaporation, is considered to be the opposing forces to the advection. So this is contrary to the scales that you're looking at, probably. Uh, yeah, so sorry, sorry. So, I mean, I'm just saying that uh, what holds true at the meso scale uh, across other scales, it could be completely the opposite story. Yeah, I think, I think sort of the so I'm not a specialist on MJO, but there are some studies leaking aggregation and MJO. And, and I think one of the this is a really good question, and I've thought about this a lot. I think it's very important that we can, um, we can, uh, investigate whether those idealized setting feedbacks do occur in the real world. And MGO is one place where it has been looked at. And I think the thing is when people look at the circulation and separate it from radiation, it's not accounting for all the radiative feedback in the sense that radiation itself, yes, it cools uh, or it warms, but it also generates the circulation. I mean, the, the flow will respond to it. And here it's actually the radiatively driven circulation that matters 
at the beginning in particular. At the end, the, the direct diabetic feedback, the fact that you have less uh, radiative cooling from the cloud, from the moist region helps also. So you have less energy lost from the moist region, so that's also a positive feedback. But I think the fact that the circulation is a big term does not mean that radiation does not play a role in it. And this is something you can quantify, like how much of the circulation is due to radiation, sort of quantify if you're close to the equator at least. Um, and then for the MJO, there are some idealized studies. I haven't followed all the literature, but um, and I, I tend to have a bias towards I idealized know. studies, I have to admit. But there's one looking at the MJO in aquaplanet simulations, and they remove the wishy effect and the radiative effects, like uh, like we did in those simulation of uh, the sensitivity runs where we remove the surface flux or the short wave. And what they find is that the surface, uh, I think the surface flux is important for um, for the MJO propagation and the radiation is important for the MJO formation. And this is a paper by Marat and Kerry. And I see Alison nodding, so I'm, I got this right. So, so actually, if you do if you do denial like sense or a mechanism denial experiments, when you turn off the, the radiation or whatever diabetic feedback, you get not only the direct diabetic effect but also the circulation that it entails. And again, these were idealized aquaplanets, so um, it would be really super nice to do this in more realistic settings. But that's a very important question, of course, yes. Thank you. You're very welcome, thank you. Alison? Hi, uh, thanks, Caroline. That was a really great overview. Um, you packed a lot into 30 minutes, but that was awesome. And I definitely encourage everyone to to read the review paper that Caroline is referring to. It's, it's excellent. We read it in our group last semester. Um, I guess I actually wanted a question that sort of is related to Vasu's question about the different spatial scales at which all of these mechanisms operate. Um, and in particular, maybe regards to the cold pool, the evaporation driven cold pools um, that you mentioned and how like there's this kind of like dual role where they can trigger organization, um, but also suppress it um, through the kind of mixing that I cause. And I wondered how you thought the spatial scale played a role in the kind of relative balance of those sort of opposing and favoring factors. Like, could we maybe think of it as cold pools helping organization at the kind of cloud scale maybe, but then suppressing a, the like larger scale organization where it's more like you have still individual, you know, convective systems within this kind of moist envelope and yeah just wondering if you could comment on your thoughts about I totally that. agree. I think the this discrepancy although it hasn't really I forgot where the slide is but it hasn't really been addressed completely but I think this discrepancy between cold pools helping and not helping is a matter of scale it's a matter of scale and in fact there's some so I I, I think that's the that's the key to this like if you look on a um on a, a larger scale it's going to favor in the sense that if you have more clouds here it depends also how you know how convective it is overall, but in in RCE anyway, you, you must have you know some of it not convecting, some of it convecting, and in that case, whenever you have clouds here, they're gonna the cold pool spreading will localize the clouds in this uh, region, uh, and on the large scale, you you can have a place that's completely devoid because it's not visited by by cold pool. Um, but if you look at at smaller scale, even the cloud itself, like if you look at the, the cold pool is actually disorganizing the cloud itself. So at the scale of the cloud, it's clearly a disorganizing effect. So there is somewhere in between. Um, so I was sort of convinced by this, but then I saw this disturbing talk. Do you know, um, uh, he's a, he was a postdoc with Romain Fievé. He was a postdoc with Jan Harter. So some papers from Jan Harter's group mm -hmm. where they redo those, just those ones, like the popcorn radiative convective equilibrium at different resolution. And when they go to very, very fine resolution, they have aggregation on large scales just by cold pool. Okay. So, I mean, I don't think always that the highest resolution because those models were developed for, you know, not tens of meters, it's not LES, but uh, so I don't know if it's the truth. I don't take the highest resolution as necessarily being the truth because you know, we, we've played with LES for long enough to know that it's all sensitive to the microphysics to some extent. And But I think it's super interesting. It shows how um, the resolving the cold pools and the cold pools dynamics can actually lead to surprises. Yeah, that's a good point. I think it's interesting to think about, especially if we as we consider real world convective organization where 
likely all of these different mechanisms are happening at the same time, which ones um, kind of are yeah more dominant um, for different situations and at different scales. Um, yeah, and that was that was sort of the idea of this review was okay. Here's here are the mathematical models, and maybe we use this theoretical framework not to go to data. And this is sort of what we tried to do with the radiation with the Benjamin Fillier, uh, whom you know, a mm -hmm. in the group, former professor, um, and look at the radiative profiles in data and see is there is it consistent first with those radiative pooling profiles and and uh, yeah. Um, it's still difficult because, yeah, in real life you have everything, but maybe you can isolate places where it's somewhat different. I, I, I also am very uh, excited about Diamond or Next Gems, these global high resolution simulations, um, because then we can, it, we have similar tools as this, but in realistic settings. And you have the MJO, and you have turbo cyclones, and you have wind shear, and you have land ocean contrast, and, and so maybe there. Uh, maybe there, there's something, you know, I mean, there's definitely something to be done with those simulations, but I think in terms of organization, we could learn a lot. Yeah, for sure. We'll try anyway. <laughs> we'll try. <laughs> Thanks. Okay. <clears throat> Caroline, there's one small question uh, from Hayden. Uh, he's, he's asking, what are, what are the pros and cons of convective aggregation in modeling convective organization? Ah, the pros is it's interesting. It's fun. We've learned so much along the way. And uh, oh, cellular automata. Sorry, <laughs> convective aggregation. Oh, sorry. <laughs> I said I mean I said it's for convective aggregation because I think that's interesting. Um, so it's fascinating. We've learned a lot. And at this point, <laughs> no worries. Um, at this point, I think whether or not it's relevant, all those processes in the real world, I mean, they, they probably occur. The question is, is it first order, second order, third order compared to land ocean contrast? Um, I think we've learned so much on how convection interacts with its environment that it's been extremely valuable. And uh, the cons is that it's super sensitive, especially on those square simulations. It's really a phase transition. It's either it aggregates or not. So part of the solution is on uh, more realistic settings or rectangular domains like Alison has been doing where it's a little less uh, brutal, the transition. But I would say that's one thing that at least has made it difficult for me to, to uh, study aggregation because it's so sensitive and then it's really a zero or one. There's no intermediate scaling. And then uh, the present kind of cellular automata, I think um, by cellular automata, I guess you mean those, um, oops, sorry, those sort of a simple models where you have a lattice. I wanted to go to the credit again, Mac, because I think that was the first one for aggregation, where you have a lattice and at each point you have a certain rule. Um, so it's sort of a microstate, um, oh, Bankston papers. Uh, okay, so do you wanna actually, you can just, can you speak up or? Is it, yeah, that's fine. Okay, maybe that's easier. Yeah, so I heard you we referring to with the lattices. I know I just read about that, but most of my paper, I think it was like Bankson, she did um, using CA to model equatorial waves, and then she also did using squalines in Europe. And that's what I'm kind of working on. My thesis is kind of using CA in a simplified model for organization. So like I didn't know um, like how effective you thought it was, or like what are the pros and like the downsides of using CA in a simplified model. Okay, and how, what type of CLA, like, is it a, a lattice and you have micro state, state rules and you look at the macro state emerging? Can you be more specific on the cellular? Okay, type? so yeah, it's on um, it's on square grids and actually just uses um, a probability of cape exceedance of instability building over. Okay, um, so it's, oh, sorry. Uh, it's interesting because uh, actually I, uh, have met Keshav when uh, he was in France. We were both in France, and he started working on something like this <laughs> well back. So I think I think it's super interesting. We learn a lot because whenever you you keep the simplest, uh, I mean, you really have the essence of the of the physical process. You just have you know probability of occurrence. So all the physical details like the droplets and everything, you don't care about this. You just have the you boil it down to one parameter, which is cape, and right. one, one uh, critical threshold, which is the cape that you have to exceed to convect. So I think you can learn a lot from this. Uh, I mean, obviously making a link with the uh, reality is difficult. And I've, I've tried for the, um, the Craig and Mac paper. So here, again, I think the beauty of this paper uh, is that they boil it down into one equation for humidity and you have three terms. All you need is a moistening, uh, drying, and uh, some horizontal mixing or transport. 
And it doesn't matter. I mean, you know, the, the nice thing is as long as you have those three, some physical process giving motioning and it's, it can be anything or some, some um, uh, physical process giving you drying, you can get aggregation. So then yes, the drying could be radiation, could be surface flux feedback. But what I liked is that they didn't get lost you know, in those details. When we were studying like, which radiative feedback is it, they said, no, it's just anything that dries and they still have aggregation. So I think that the, the height that you get are the, um, the, larger, uh, the larger range of parameters that you can reach is, is really nice or the degree of abstraction is really, really nice. And then, then making the link to reality is, is difficult. Like I've tried to map my simulations onto their equations, and I wasn't really convinced that it was so easy. So, so it doesn't mean it's not possible. I just dropped it because I didn't know how, how to make it work. But I think just quantitatively matching to reality is difficult. But, but qualitatively, I think what you learn is super interesting. Yeah, I definitely found that. It's definitely hard to, to emulate real-world scenarios using CA but there's still some interesting um, applications. Yeah. All right. Um, seems like we have uh, reached the end of the discussion. Uh, thank you very much, Caroline. That's a very nice talk. Thank you uh, very much. Really sorry for the delay, but thank you. We kept uh, it into almost one hour. So thanks, everyone. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, all right. Um, uh, let's wrap up. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Kevin.